expert uh, club fitters with me today. We're going to talk a little bit of, of club fitting, talk about golf, talk about anything that comes up right now. Uh, I have James Tracy, James Wave to everybody out there. Oh, yeah. We got Aaron Roth. And then we got Thomas Campbell. So you guys have seen uh, all three of these guys actually um, on our YouTube channel over the past few weeks. Uh, Thomas has been very involved over the last year or so. Uh, so today we're just going to have a discussion about fitting, how uh, how things are going, how second swing and, and these guys personally are adjusting to uh, maybe the current situation. And then we'll talk golf, talk golf trends, talk uh, what these guys maybe specialize in and then maybe what they do outside of club fitting as well. Uh, so... First of all, before we get into things, just want to invite anybody out there that is watching to post some questions for these guys. These guys are uh, the best of the best in the business for club fitting. Uh, they have all the knowledge in the world. So uh, pose them any questions. They'll be able to answer them for you as we go here. Uh, but let's just get it started here by asking uh, what you guys are up to, because I know you, everybody's role has changed a little bit uh, over the past few weeks here. Uh, I can hear some phones ringing from you guys at the Minnetonka store. So, uh, what are you guys doing? We'll start. We'll start with James, and then we'll go to Thomas and Aaron. Yeah. Well, I've been uh, my my role as fitter hasn't really changed. It's just the environment has changed. Um, you know, doing fittings from the comfort of my office here. Uh, a lot of video and phone fittings, which uh, has been a fun challenge. Um, you know, the process doesn't really change, but you know the you know the TrackMan numbers aren't there that uh, validation sometimes isn't there. But for a lot of golfers, you know, I've been able to talk with people that never, I would never get the chance to meet in the store. And that probably never had the chance to actually get custom fit uh, because they might live in a remote location or they might not be close to a second swing store. So that's been really fun to meet some folks from around the country and, and build some new bridges and, um, and hopefully find uh, some good toys for uh, folks as they get back to the course. Well, are you guys at the store? Yeah, it, it definitely has changed at the store with us being uh, closed since the, the last few weeks. Um, priority switched to essentially selling a lot of our equipment on secondswing.com. So we've been doing over the phone fittings, just like kind of James has been a little bit there too. Um, essentially, you know, a lot of, I've been personally doing a lot of club repair or club requests, whether that be custom orders, regripping, uh, reshafting, um, extensions, all, all of the above there. So I've got actually kind of pretty handy in the workshop room, which is, it's just been kind of fun for me to kind of go through that and learn, learn, learn about that. I know Aaron's been finding a lot of golf clubs in our, in our store. <laughs> yeah. 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 They magically don't uh, just fly out of the rocket launcher and ship themselves. So making boxes, making labels and shipping clubs. It's what we're doing. And now we have curbside. So that's, that's been an added bonus for us. Um, you know, during this difficult time. Um, lots of curbside orders. Like Drew said, the phone's been ringing off the hook, so we're still uh, still doing a lot of business on, on that avenue. Yeah, so you guys generally, you know, club fitters, right? You're working face-to-face -face with customers. Can't do that for the time being. However, uh, at least the Minnesota stores are opening for appointments next week. Some great news there. Scottsdale, Arizona location has been open for, I think this is the second week now it's been open for that appointment only basis. And then the other stores are soon to follow, uh, hopefully. So uh, slowly opening back up and, you know, I guess the roles will probably adjust a little bit too, uh, based on what you guys did before and then kind of after this whole uh, situation. But um, as the stores are opening, golf courses are kind of slowly opening too. It's getting closer and closer to kind of 100% open across the country. Uh, Minnesota has been open for a few weeks now. Uh, have you guys gotten to play any golf? Uh, I know things have been really busy at, with second swing, trying to get things moving and keep things rolling. But have you guys been able to play some golf? Uh, we'll start, uh, Aaron. Uh, yeah, we uh, we are fortunate to be playing here for the last few weeks, playing at least a couple times a week, um, waiting for leagues to start up um, at the main course that I play, Chaska Town Course. But uh, beyond that, yeah, probably seven, eight times so far. Courses are beautiful here. Oh, yeah. And Thomas, you actually play, you know, for those who don't know, Thomas plays professionally and does really well for, uh, you know, in the Minnesota PGA section and other professional events. But I'm, I'm assuming those have not been taking place. So uh, what are you doing to kind of, uh, you know, how are you getting out on the golf course and, and practicing and getting ready for competition when it's up there again? 
Yeah, my uh, my practice and play has actually been pretty pretty limited. Uh, I've been going through the process of trying to sell my home at the, during this time. The same, so it's been a little challenging there. So I've been a little preoccupied. Um, but you know, I'm excited to get back out and play and compete. I'll, in these next few weeks, I'll definitely find the range a little more. Start kind of grinding on on the game. It feels really good. I was just uh, you know, kind of explaining here before that I had the chance to take TrackMan outside, and my swing numbers were basically really neutral. So I was really surprised even before time off that how good my swing and hold up. So that just goes to show all the practice that I've done long term. Um, so I'm excited to start competing here. June 8th, hopefully is going to be my first event, first assistance event. We'll see if that gets pushed back or not. I don't really have too much. It ramps up kind of beginning of July for me for a lot of more events. Uh, a little disappointed. Q school has been canceled, so I won't be kind of doing that this year. The US Open, qualifier that's going to qualifying is now going to be in the fall with the u.s open going to be in november um so might have a little more events to play here later in the year and james how are you uh are you able to get to the golf course at all or are you pretty busy with uh your fittings with uh second swing you how's that going well like thomas said you know with q school being canceled that kind of ruins my season yeah. too, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, we all have. That's really tough news there, Thomas. Um, no, my, my game's kind of taking a back seat too. I've, probably not just because of the pandemic. Probably the last couple of seasons, I probably neglected my game um, to the benefit of all the customers I work with, though. Let's say it that way. Um, I got a little putting green in the basement that gets some action. But um, you know, I'm hoping here as uh, the weather starts to turn, uh, you know, I'll get the old uh, wrenches out and. Um, and start fine tuning the this to fine tuning the game there, Drew. Yeah, I, I like how Thomas jumps on and just tells us all of his great trackman numbers. How his swing is perfectly neutral. I mean, I, I, you know, that his swing was so good. Did you hear that? Right. Like, I can't believe how neutral it was. <laughs> yeah, just you telling know? everybody how great his swing is and how yeah. You know, I don't think you know very few people can relate to that right now. Uh, so good for you, Thomas. We're happy for you. Yes, we are. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I still, I still up here though. That's 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 the problem. Even though it doesn't ah. quite doesn't quite sink through that far. Sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, for those who don't know, um, Aaron actually has a pretty interesting group of clients he works with regularly. Uh, some some yeah. interesting names, famous names uh, to some people in the Minnesota area in particular. So, uh, for those you know, if you haven't seen it yet on YouTube, he and um, Tim Heron had a dis fireside chat, so to speak, <laughs> uh, about a half hour long. Okay. They got into some great detail about. Uh, Tim's transition to the Champions Tour and how this whole situation has impacted things a little bit. Uh, but Aaron, uh, can you maybe give us some stories, maybe some some of the behind the scenes, not necessarily just with Tim, but some of your um, other other clients, other golfers that you work with? Well, I would say, you know, starting with, with good old Lumpy, um, you know, everybody says that, you know, he's the funniest guy on tour and, you know, his his personality you know, basically fits with players that are 22 years old out on tour and, you know, Bernhard Longers of, of the world, mm -hmm. you know, he gets along with everybody. And uh, a lot of the stories I can't exactly share specifically, um, there's a little language barrier, but um, just, just being able to uh, be there down in Florida for his first uh, champions tour event was, was really cool to kind of see how he prepared for a tournament. Um, see all his family and friends down there too. There was quite a, quite a big group of us, but, um, and then after the round, you know, he's, he still wanted to go grind on the putting green and work on his game. It's a, uh, it's a never ending battle. And uh, seemingly with him and a lot of other players that I've been fortunate to work with, it uh, stops and starts with the putter. So um, watching his routine, watching what he's working on, stuff like that has been, uh, has been pretty interesting. Um, you know, it's not just uh, trunk slamming like uh, like we do when we go play. Um, you know, there's a lot more that goes into it. And for the for the other players that that were professional athletes in in other sports, to see how they used you know their mental toughness and their determination and uh, uh, I guess athletic ability in different ways to to translate into their golf game. I mean, it's it's. There's no harder game on the planet, and that's why so many professional athletes, when they retire or while they're still playing, at least, um, they all gravitate towards the game of golf because you can never perfect it. And just to see these individuals that are just, you know, Stanley Cup winning 
individuals or, you know, World Series winners, you know, try a different sport that they are not professionals at. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a grind and they love it. It is it's quite amazing how passionate they are about about the sport and about getting better. You know, on that yeah. point, Aaron, with with professional athletes, something I've noticed, too, is that, you know, if you look at like basketball, baseball, hockey, you know, there's definitely equipment. But it's not like golf where you're customizing your equipment so specifically to your performance. And so I think what I've found working with some professional athletes like you do is that they really get hooked on equipment quick, especially when they're talking to guys like us, because, you know, they realize that because of their competitive nature, they want their golf clubs to do everything that is possible uh, from equipment. And so, you know, it's been really fun to work with those athletes because they, uh, you know, they really get passionate about equipment like we do. Oh, it probably, absolutely. It probably humanizes them too a little bit because, you know, you see these guys in, you know, on, on TV, when you watch them play, uh, compete, they're like the greatest, you know, in the world at what they do. And they try something that so many other people can do, right? Like a, anybody from age five to 90 or anywhere in between can play golf and they try that and, you know, they're not the best in the world anymore. And so they right. become, it's more, it's, yeah, it's the human element of it. It, it Golf is, is fun that way, I guess. Uh, okay, let's, uh, so you guys with, with fitting, right? So I wanted to ask you guys about some fitting trends that maybe have taken place in 2020. Obviously a bunch of new products came out from all of our favorite manufacturers. Um, in your fittings prior to all the pandemic stuff, did you guys notice any trends or any top products being sold? Uh, what did you guys notice there? We'll start with Thomas. I think for me, kind of looking at maybe like the, the game improvement area, I've, I've noticed last two, three years, the Ping G line has done really, really well. So for me, I've noticed, you know, Ping G, G400, um, G410 now has always, it always performs really well. It's forgiving, it's playable. It always kind of does really, all my fittings, I seem they always can perform really across the board. They may not go quite as far as some of these other irons that may be juiced a little bit more. Um, but forgiveness is, is right there and playability. And we're just kind of talking about kind of descent angle and stopping power. It, it, it kind of gives it all. So that's one thing I've noticed um, performs really well across the board. How about you, Aaron? Did you notice anything? Well, I would say that manufacturers, for the most part across the board, aren't really afraid of any price point for that. Uh, you know, like when PXG came out, everybody was like, who is going to spend that much money on clubs? Well, Mr. Parsons proved everybody, everybody wrong. And now you've got the likes of like the T400 with Titleist, you know, it's as big as the super game improvement from PXG. Um, you've got the Epic uh, Star Flash, which, you know, the lofts are getting lower and lower and lower and the ball is going farther and farther and farther. And not, you know, and that's gonna change a lot of different aspects of, of how that ball comes into the green. So as fitters, we gotta be very careful, you know, somebody wants more distance, we can easily get that. But to what end? You know, we don't want to have to move to Scotland and run the ball up to every single green because it's rolling out 40 yards. You know, so you kind of have to be careful with that. Right. How about you, James? Yeah, one trend I've seen is as to spin, you know, I, even the last like 18 months, think how popular like TP5X or even the AVX, like these low spin golf balls uh, started to gain some momentum. Well, with how many irons are producing pretty low spin rates, almost every driver you can build to have low spin tendencies. I'm not seeing as many low spin golf balls out there. And if, in fact, over the phone, a lot of players, because you can fit the equipment so easily to get spin in the right category, I'm seeing more and more players switching back to a ball that has more spin uh, to give them more consistency in their irons, maybe more green side spin. Um, you know, sometimes from a feel standpoint. So, you know, I've seen a trend with a lot of the players that I'm working with who maybe 18 months ago, we were looking at a lower spinning golf ball. Now we're kind of building their equipment more lower spinning and that's allowing them to go back to a golf ball that maybe they preferred. Um, so I, I've seen that trend big time. One of the things I've noticed is this growth of different iron categories. Like, so I, uh, earlier this, I think it was early February, uh, Thomas actually fit me for a combo set for I-210s and I-500 uh, irons from Ping. And so, like, I was able to get in there, you know, players and players distance iron combo. Uh, you know, there's 
again, so many more different categories. And like now Titleist has what? Like you got, if you look at their line, you know, the 620 MB, 620 CBs, T100, T100S, T200, T300, T4. That's like seven different irons all in their current lineup. So with these expanded iron categories, how has that changed your fitting process for irons? Start with Thomas. Yeah, I think it definitely helps. Um, now, it's the nice piece to it that I like to talk about is it's not just focused on what handicap you've, you've got. It depends on how good a ball striker you are, what you're looking to achieve on the golf course, whether you're trying to get distance or you're trying to get workability. Um, they all help fine tune to what that specific player is needing out of, out of their golf game. Um, now, yes, there's a lot of different options out there, um, a lot of good options there too, but I think going back to Aaron's point there is make sure that it's specific to the golfer. Um, we don't want to have a club that, for example, is t going too low. We want to make sure we have that stopping power. Um, so I would say the advantage we've got now with all these manufacturers across the board, so many different options, we can make the fitting so specific to the golfer. I think I said, James, golfers, yeah, well, James, yeah. one thing I was curious about is with your, the second swing, you too, how the, how the training has changed as well with so many different iron categories being yeah. uh, created here. Well, for sure. I mean, especially, you know, looking at doing fittings over the phone, the only way you're going to be able to help recommend is to understand how the product is designed, how it's engineered, who it's for. And so we spend a lot of time in the off season and during the season as new products are being launched um, to train our guys on, you know, really what is changing, you know, what, well, how is I am going to spin? How is it going to feel? How is it going to compare to previous generations and how does it compare brand to brand? And we need to know those things to give players the confidence to, when they come in to see us, we don't need to hit 35 different iron models to figure out what's going to fit them the best. You know, we can hone in on a pocket of irons that checks all the right boxes um, and even within that same category, you know, with the experience that, you know, the three guys here on the call have, I mean, we already have a pretty good idea of how they're going to compare on a track man. And then also how a consumer is going to talk about them, you know, which ones feel soft, which ones feel harsh, which ones feel good, which ones maybe lack a little bit of feel. Um, and I think all of that knowledge, you know, the more we can spread that to our team, the better, you know, we have the luxury of working with golfers for a half hour, an hour or more. Um, whereas a lot of the people that work at Second Swing, you know, who help golfers into the right clubs don't have that luxury, right? They need to make snap decisions and sometimes with less experience. And so, you know, our internal university program really helps bring our employees up to speed and gives them a lot of really good um, tactics to help golfers, you know, narrow the confusing world of golf clubs down to items that really are going to help them get better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now for you guys over, I guess, yes, your experience varies for sure. Um, but I'm just curious because I, even in the year and a half, two years that I've been involved with golf and working at second swing, so much has changed already. So I wanted to see if maybe you guys had one thing that you could pick out that has really changed in club fitting throughout your, your experience, all of your career in club fitting. We'll start with Aaron. Um, I would just, it, it would have to be the, the launch monitor itself i mean when i first started over nine years ago we basically had two nets no launch monitor nothing just hit off a piece of plastic and, and go from there and then through getting some on course uh feedback from them knowing which direction we should go with that equipment um and then from there getting getting the uh foresight uh gc2 and gc quad and then transitioning over to uh to trackman fours which it's a game changer. Um, you can't hide. We, we know we are not like Thomas. Uh, I don't have a concept of what zero, zero, zero is. Um, but with all the data that we can get from having somebody hit a few shots on TrackMan, it's, you know, it's never going to get to the point, hopefully, where, uh, you know, the computer or the, the TrackMan fits it, fits a player itself. But, um, you know, it's, it's light years from, from where we were when we started. How about you, Thomas? Yeah, going back to like the chase for the distance. Yes, we've started to reach limits with all these equipment. Um, and you manufacture what they have essentially with regards to limiting the COR and everything like that. Um, what I've noticed is kind of going back to with what Aaron said, technology has helped us reach, get these players to reach that distance, even with these limitations. So we're able to kind of 
really use the advantage of the golf clubs that are performing really, really well, um, gone longer and further than ever, but they've always reached that kind of potential. But this technology that we've got now with TrackMan, with Foresight, with everything, is we're able to then really fine-tune everything possible we can to really provide more distance for the players. And then also not just distance, but getting the right spin on their irons, on their wedges, and making sure that they've got the right club in their hand too. And now you, James, you've got a pretty diverse background in golf too, in terms of, you know, you've been, you've worked in Florida, you've worked in California, you've worked with tour professionals. Um, well, how was your experience? Well, what's your perspective on this, on this question and how things have changed? And I guess it, cause your role has changed quite a bit too. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, Aaron nailed it. I mean, you know, like the past decade, the launch monitor has definitely been the biggest shift um, positively. And <laughs> Thomas was, kind of self-deprecating himself before we jumped on about how the track man can also uh, paralyze you a little bit with the numbers. And so in a way the track man's made fitting easier, but it's also made it more complicated uh, because now sometimes a customer is waiting for the track man to validate that a club is better, even though as a fitter, we might know that the technology and the, the fit is a correct fit. You almost need to validate it with the, with the launch monitor. So, you know, that, that, that art and science of fitting um, has evolved you know as the as the stats and the numbers and just the overall knowledge that customers have has evolved um you know the two things that came to mind for me just you know over the last decade plus um in my experience is just the way golf bags are designed are different not that the bag itself but like the set makeup i mean 10 years ago everybody was driver three with five wood four to pitching wedge two wedges and a putter but now it's not even close to that i mean you got iron sets with 41 degree pitching wedges you have utility irons you have this common you know combo iron sets right you have specialty high toe wedges from tailor-made that look nothing like their other wedges um and then all the different options that you have on the top end of your bag as well and so you know it's really rare to have a, a full bag fitting back to back where the sets look anything alike and so i think that that versatility kind of how we were talking earlier about how you know the the addition of so many different models it's kind of like buying a car, right? I mean, it's not like, hey, here's your truck and here's your sedan, right? You have SUVs, you have compacts, you have, you know, crossovers, you have everything. So, you know, no matter what your style and performance is like, you really have, you know, options that um, that can fit you specifically. Um, so that's been the biggest change, just more options and, and more diversity in the equipment in general. Absolutely. And obviously driving that is to technology, but whether it's the launch monitors, whether it's the adjustability on the clubs um, and whether it's just simply the manufacturing of new models, new designs, new shapes uh, that just it provides more performance and more uh, customization for, for golfers out there. So and what, one thing I wanted to transition to and ask you guys about, cause this is kind of a, a funny story that's taken place for through second swing over the past couple of months. So back in February, um, a, a customer posted a photo on, uh, on Twitter of a 975D Titleist driver at our Minnetonka store that was five and a half degrees. You guys must maybe know what I'm talking about. So it was five and a half degrees aloft, right? Uh, I think the club got shipped out to a customer then in California who bought it, tried it out. Uh, then he asked his Twitter followers who wants to try it, sent it to somebody else. And since then it's gone to, I believe, six states now. But it's pretty cool actually. And you guys can follow along on Twitter. We're going to be posting more updates on where it's at. But um, I just wanted to get from you guys is there any scenario where you would fit somebody today with a five and a half degree driver is that even possible i don't even know if it's possible but is there any scenario where that would work aaron uh i would like to defer this one to james seeing as though you know we talk about uh having you know different combinations of of things that are kind of uh out of the ordinary uh i think i think james is the king for this one yeah the um i like a low loft in my driver <laughs> um, I've been, I've been testing Sim at six degrees. Uh, I know Kevin Kraft, uh, who's one of our other fitters. He's not terribly long, but he hits the ball a mile in the air, um, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with a stronger loft. Um, while it's not very accurate, you can get better ball speed and you definitely can lower trajectory with a very low loft. So Drew, to answer your question, if it's someone with historically high ball flight and, to couple that with very accurate uh, performance off the tee, which is a rare combination. Yeah, you could find a person playing a five and a half degree driver, but you got to remember too, that, that's, I haven't seen that club 
but it's an older model, correct? It's not yeah, yeah. newer. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, back then the center of gravity on drivers was totally different. You know, the height you would get on a today, on a 2020 5.5 degrees. I mean, that would be an absolute knuckleball. Um, so with modern equipment, five and a half degrees is, yeah, it's pretty rare, but on an old school driver like that, you know, I might have to jump in the ring. I might have to hit this thing. That sounds like fun. <laughs> I, I I asked uh, I asked the individual that bought it to uh, send it back full circle once it hits a few more states. So hopefully that happens. And James, you and I will go take it out for a test drive. Yeah. Say, so, Drew, I see uh, I've seen some of the comments. Uh, shout out to Kevin and Justin for uh, shouting out second yeah. screen. But then I see Aaron, our buddy John Barba. Oh uh, yeah. Just a question there from my golf spies. So we should get to that one. He said, "What's the next yeah, big technology it. milestone?" Is there much left to be found in clubs and are the technology breakthroughs coming in fitting? Um, Thomas, what do you think on that question there? Yeah, no, I you know, we definitely have been reaching limitations. I think it definitely comes back to what we kind of talked about with regards to, you know, fitting the fitting process alone, just to really help get that customer, you know, really fine tuned dialed, you know, with the technology that we've got coming and updated all the time with, with TrackMan, with, with Foresight. Um, I got the chance to talk with the other day with the TrackMan rep, and he talked about the the new Tracy fitting fitting app. And I know James really likes the the name of, of that one with your last name there. But uh, he was, yeah, yeah, I was willing to, I was willing to allow them to use that. So yeah. we, we worked it out. <laughs> I think that's going to be very groundbreaking because then they can analyze all the previous data and really help us in fittings too. So you know, AI has definitely helped with some other manufacturers here too, but even uh, even TrackMan's really jumping on that too. So I think there's definitely more to be found in clubs, um, but I think, you know, by using, you know, club equipment, technology, launch monitor technology, the knowledge of all the fitters around the country, I think, you know, we've still got definitely room for improvement. I'll jump in here too. I think one of the things that I'd like to see happen you know, just like in, in baseball, you can you can use a metal bat up until you become a professional and then you got to go back to what, you know, I think that the game of golf is obviously very, very difficult, uh, no matter how good your equipment is, is fitted to you. But I would like to see it where they would have, you know, illegal equipment for professionals, but for your, you know, player that plays, you know, once a month, you know, let them play with whatever club they want. If they want to have 30 clubs in their bag, so be it. You know, if uh, if it can make the game more fun, do it. You know, have a wedge that, that you can spin back 50 feet, whatever. You know, some players have never done that before. So if, they could, if there was a way to have equipment that was not necessarily legal for the professionals, but, you know, your your regular amateur could could play them whenever, you know, just as they're they're having fun on the weekends with their buddies, you know, have at it. You still got to get it in the hole. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. John, to answer your question for me, as I think about it, um, I agree with Thomas and Aaron for sure. And I think the next big technology is here. It's just a matter of getting more people to use it, which is um, stat tracking devices. Um, so as fitters, we can actually learn how people golf and not just take them for their word. You know, how many of our fittings guys, do people come in telling us what they need in terms of an upgrade? Hey, I need a new driver or, you know, I want to purchase new irons. You know, and we can't really argue them because we don't know their game. You know, we don't know what they're struggling with. We have to kind of wait for them to bring up their issue, you know, but to be able to actually dissect their game, you know, digitally by looking at their greens and regulation or their distance gapping or where their strokes gain are maybe falling short. That gives us more information to uh, make make better club decisions. I see you guys are laughing there at Justin's comment. That's good. Um, I think I think I think our, I think brands like Arcos and and Game Golf and and just getting more golfers to use that prior to a fitting and post fitting, you know, gives us a lot more information than what we are gleaning just from that um, that one on one experience before they buy their club. So I, I think that's probably the next big change um, is implementing that into our fitting process um, for sure. All right. Well, let's, let's get to Justin's here. We'll go two for and have Aaron get both of those questions that he asked. So we'll go uh, first one. How much how much do do you weigh player preference in curve and trajectory in your fittings? And then also, when is Aaron going to shave the beard? <laughs> uh, uh, Lori would like that answer to be uh, yesterday, but uh, that's not going to happen. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, if I'm fitting you, I just 
I just listen and, and try to do whatever the heck you want me to, to do. Um, you know, for the average player that, uh, you know, struggles just getting an airborne and forward, the straighter we can get it to go, the better, you know, but a lot of players like hitting different shots and different trajectories or windows. Um, I know everybody's heard that phrase before, you know, and it just depends on their technique and, and what their current equipment is and, and figuring out, um, you know, how do we take off a little bit of spin or how do we lower that trajectory or hit it higher? Um, how do we get the ball? I mean, with TrackMan, you know, like I said before, Thomas is, you know, path is zero and face is zero. Uh, we don't see that uh, very often. So using TrackMan to kind of be able to show a, an individual player of what's causing what in reference to uh, their equipment and their swing and how uh, those two things interact, uh, the TrackMan data really, really helps us. Um, you know, if we're trying to move the ball right to left or left to right, um, yeah, we can certainly work on that through through some of the equipment, um, especially with movable weights and drivers and, and fairway woods and whatnot. Um, but most of that just depends on the player's uh, technique and how much they're practicing. Gotcha. Uh, we are <clears throat> running a little bit short on time here, so we're trying to go through these last few questions here quick. Um, Aaron, you got another one here we have from Kyle. He was just saying that um, you put him into some, looks like Apex Pros with extra stiff yep. shafts. Mm -hmm. um, and then he's asking about, you know, should the rest of his bag also be an extra stiff? Um, or does that maybe vary depending on the player's uh, tendencies? It really does. It really does depend on the player and their tendencies. Um, Kyle, I would say schedule a fitting with me as soon as possible. I, uh, I know that since we're doing appointments only starting Monday, they're starting to get get booked out but um you know it really is a case by case uh scenario whether it's you know going from say an extra stiff dr driver down to stiff flex and the irons uh weight has a lot to do with it as well so um you know we start with the head figure out the the loft and, and configuration of that center of gravity uh and then move on to the shaft but it is an integral part of the fitting and uh i would come back in and see me all right. Awesome. Uh, Mark, we'll answer Mark, Mark's question here. Uh, is it even appropriate for the weekend player to compare to TV play, assuming players that you'd see on television? Uh, Thomas, why don't you go for that one? Yeah, no, I, I would say, yeah, yes. Um, TV play, you're seeing the players hit their best shots. You know, these players, you know, you're seeing the best shots on TV all the time. Yes, Tiger Woods, you'll see a lot of shots by him. But these other players that are on TV, you're not seeing their bad shots. So these players, you know, they're, they're human. They're not, they're not robots. Even though you talk about my path being zero, zero or anything like that. It's not like that all the time when you're under pressure. Yes. You, you know, you, you'll slip up. You'll hit that bad shot. I think played a couple of weekends ago and I hit it. I hit a drive about 60 yards to the right just by not playing too much. And all of a sudden I left that face 15 degrees open. And all of a sudden I look like kind of like your, your average player that has a big slice. Um, but it, it happens. We all hit bad shots. So I would say, you know, Yes, it's easy to compare. It's great to watch these guys on, on tour, but, you know, they're only human too. All right, we'll go – we'll do uh, Scott and, and Caleb's questions here, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. So, uh, Scott, I have another one for you, Aaron. Um, someone comes in for an iron fitting or any fitting, really. Uh, do you steer them to a specific manufacturer? Uh, no, no, definitely not. Uh, it's it's going to be a combination of – obviously, the player has got to like the look and feel of – uh, the club that, that they're going to be purchasing. Um, certain brands have specific models that are going to be appropriate uh, for some players and for others, absolutely not, you know, and, and through our fitting process, we, we can whittle it down, you know, from 300 different options to three best. And then here's your, here's your good option. Here's a better option. Here's the best option um, based on the numbers and, and the feedback that we're getting uh, and then let them decide. Um, you know, like James, I think James said it earlier, if you don't like what you're looking down at, you're probably not going to have a lot of confidence. So that's, that is, uh, that is a big part of it, but no, no brand specific. I mean, if you look at any of our bags, we're all over the place. Uh, we're not getting paid by any of the manufacturers to play anything. So I think right now in my bag, I've got six different manufacturers in there. Uh, so yeah, there's no favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Caleb here is asking now, I, th I think Thomas might just say himself for this one, but uh, who is the top player any of you have ever fitted? <laughs> I was going to say Thomas too. 
you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's been, there's, I've had the opportunity to work with a few major champions. Obviously I didn't contribute to that success, but um, <laughs> you know, and on a couple other uh, different tours, I've had a chance to work with players who have made it to the highest level, but you know, unquestionably no one hits the ball like Thomas Campbell. So I'd have to answer that question hmm. with, uh, hey. with yeah, either that or Brian Hills too. Another one of our fitters. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one too. Makes my it makes me feel very insignificant with my own game when I have to do club <laughs> fitting next to those two. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to get my head too big here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I gotta uh, want to follow up on Russ Higgins's question here. What's your club in the bag? What's your go-to club in the bag, and why do you do anything custom to it? For me, it's more of a go-to shot. I have a go-to shot around the green where I try and get the ball rolling around the green as opposed to trying to hit flop shots all around the time. So from like a uh, playability on the golf course, I don't always try to hit flop shots when I've got the pin way in the back of the green. I'll probably try and roll that up there. So for me, I'd say one tip is get the ball rolling on the green. Okay. To answer, If I was going to answer that question, I'd say the, the shot – that I go to the most is the one that goes in the hole, right? I'm, I'm doing my best Thomas impression there with the, uh, nice. the big head, you know, nice. uh, anyway. Okay. Um, we're probably out of time here. I know you guys, the phone's ringing. I can hear it already a Minnetonka. So, uh, we'll let you guys get back to work and then get your schedules figured out for the next week as the stores open in Minnesota for fittings. Uh, thank you to you three for spending time today, providing some great insight, some great conversation. And thank you to the viewers as well for posing questions and, and uh, interacting with us. Just a reminder, secondswing.com is open now to ship. Uh, the Arizona store is open uh, for fittings. And then um, Minnesota stores in Minneapolis and Minnetonka will be open next week for fittings and appointments only. Curbside pickup is also open at all of our locations. So um, we're excited, I know, to have this reopening process taking place. We're really excited to have those open and interacting face-to-face -face again. But obviously, we got to do that safely. So uh, thank you again to everybody for watching, tuning in. We'll do another one of these soon. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Drew.